Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Department of Economics Roundtable on the global credit crunch and the global economy. Let me introduce to you our panelists. Our first speaker will be Mark Taylor, who's a professor of international finance and macroeconomics at Warwick. A recognized authority on foreign currency markets, Mark is currently a managing director of Barclays Global Investments, which is one of the world's largest asset managers. Mark has successfully pursued careers in both the academic and financial worlds. He was a senior economist at the IMF in Washington and was once a currency trader. Mark will preface his remarks with a short summary of how we got here. He will speak in a personal capacity. His views do not necessarily represent the views of Barclays Global Investors or any other component of the Barclays Group. Second will be Marcus Miller, a professor of economics at Warwick. Marcus was a research fellow at the Bank of England during the last autumn, witnessing at first hand the unfolding crisis of British banking. In 2002, Marcus warned in the Economic Journal about what he and his co-authors termed the Greenspan put, a one-sided intervention policy on the part of the Federal Reserve, which leads investors into the erroneous belief that they are insured against downside risk. Our last speaker will be Andrew Oswald, also a professor of economics at Warwick. Andrew is best known for his research into how economic conditions affect the psychology of well-being. He's a member of the Stiglitz Commission on how to design a new measure of social well-being beyond GDP. In 2003, he warned of the danger of the coming house price crash. Well, it's arrived. My name is Mark Harrison. I too am a professor of economics at Warwick. I'm an economic historian, which means that it's my job to be wise only after the event. <laughs> Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to, yeah, as Mark says, how we got uh, to the present uh, impasse, we got to the present situation. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, after I've talked about the causes, uh, some of the opportunities that are perhaps offered in, um, by, the, by the crisis and some threats um, that we have yet to navigate. The, you notice I have this little um, symbol at the bottom here. I don't shine the laser in my colleague's eyes, but this symbol at the bottom here. Um, I currently work, as, as Mark says, uh, for Barclays Global Investors, and that takes me to San Francisco Airport four times a year. And at the airport, I'm naturally drawn towards the self-help uh, components of the bookstore, and a book I picked up recently was called Crisis, Threat or Opportunity. And it had this, this on the cover. And this is the Chinese character for crisis. And it's made up of two characters, one which means threat and the other which means opportunity. And this was a, sort of wonderful. I thought um, it turns out to be not quite true, but that, that doesn't really matter. I mean, we can't spoil a beautiful theory with just an ugly fact. So... What I want to do is to, is to build upon that and show you some of the, uh, what I think of the opportunities for reform of the international financial regulatory system, uh, for f uh, reform or, or modification of, the, of uh, our uh, the international framework of monetary policy. And then I'll talk a little bit about some, some, some more, if you like, uh, pressing issues, uh, issues on quantitative easing that's been proposed at the Bank of England and on um, how we, uh, what, is, what is the current policy, policy paradox, what is the current policy choice. So, a little recap on how we got here. The proximate cause, of course, was the collapse in, US, in the US house price bubble combined with a huge buildup of, of debt. But the origins of the, of the crisis lie in the, in the global uh, financial, regulatory, and monetary policy structure and the very large global imbalances that have been building up for a decade or more. So about a decade or so, we see the entry of Asian emerging market economies, notably uh, China, but other East Asian economies, into the world trade and financial systems, and the development of a high level of savings and reserves acquisition in East Asia and China. And partly that was a result of um, a reaction to a previous crisis, the 1997-98 East Asian crisis, uh, when the, well, some of those East Asian economies rebounded, uh, investments didn't pick up and, and, and domestic consumption didn't pick up to quite the same degree as uh, their GDP picked up, so they had to do something with, those, uh, with, 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 those, with that uh, extra amount of output. And also I think there was a sentiment towards acquiring 
uh, w uh, large amounts of reserves, building up reserves in those countries as a kind of war chest against uh, international speculative attack that they'd found themselves so vulnerable in 97, 98. So we see this build-up of savings in these emerging markets economies with very large current account surpluses. And if you have a very large current account surplus, you're exporting more than your import. As good economists, we know you must have a capital account uh, deficit. You must be doing something with that money. And what, what happened was that money was placed uh, in developed economies where there had been a strong demand and stable inflation framework over uh, some years into the early 90s had led to uh, capital account uh, surpluses, current account deficits. So we have this slightly perverse uh, situation of capital flowing from developing to developed economies. So we see these developed countries' financial systems literally, well not literally, but awash with, uh, with, with capital seeking returns. And as a result, asset prices clearly spiraled. The financial sector expanded. And there was a um, search for the development of new financial instruments, new ways of packaging up risk, if you like, in order to generate uh, ever, ever more uh, higher demand for those financial assets to seek out um, what we in the industry like to call alpha, if you like, uh, excess return in the market. And that led to very large increases in the ratio of total debt to GDP in those countries. So that in the UK, over the period mid to late 90s to last year, the ratio of uh, total debt to GDP more than doubled, for example. And similar growth was seen in the US and Europe. Part of this um, development of um, new financial instruments involves something called securitization. That's to say, taking what were ostensibly uh, retail banking products, i.e. mortgages, bundling them up and selling them on, together with the risk to, um, to, to other individuals. Uh, and of course, that then creates a moral hazard problem in the sense that once you pass them on for a fixed fee, you've also bundled on the risk, right? And so a little bit of moral, what we call moral hazard built in there that um, there was a little bit of uh, hidden characteristics, if you like, of what that was actually in those, uh, those mortgage-backed securities package. But people were happy to buy them because they kept on increasing in value. They kept on increasing in value because people kept taking out mortgages and, they, and the house prices continued to rise. But when that, uh, when that bubble burst, those mortgage-backed securities plummeted in value. And banks holding them on their balance sheet had to reduce lending because of their reduction in asset value. So as we'll see, we'll discuss it in a little bit more detail, banks typically are required prudentially to hold a certain uh, amount of capital, a certain amount of assets, for the amount of, for the amount of loans they're lending out. So when these, uh, when these, uh, these mortgage-backed securities crashed in value, so did much of the, uh, the value of banks' ba uh, assets and their balance sheet, and they actually had to reduce lending. So reducing liquidity at the height of the crisis, which then exacerbated that crisis. So loss of liquidity spiraled, uh, there was an increase in risk appetite and a complete loss of confidence. And that's basically what happened, in my view. Okay, so let's move on. Let's ask a couple of questions. First, was the monetary policy framework to blame? Well, ever since, um, well, since the early 1990s, we've had, starting with New Zealand, then Sweden, then the UK and other countries, a shift to inflation targeting. That's to say, uh, Fairly, a fairly simple form of uh, macroeconomic or monetary policy, whereby if you forecast inflation is going to be above your target rate, you raise interest rates. If it's going to be below the forecast, the forecast is below the target rate, you reduce interest rates. And that had apparently delivered a golden, golden era. In the UK, we didn't have a recession from 92 until now. Um, historically low interest rates aimed at um, stabilizing price inflation. However, make debt easier to service, make mortgages easier to service. And to that extent, yes, to that extent, monetary policy, I guess, was to blame in that it created a period of very low interest rates uh, combined with strong growth in GDP and, and real, real household, household incomes. That led to uh, increases in, uh, in, in house price inflation and other asset price inflation. Now, think about the assumptions that uh, underlie the, um, the typical inflation targeting uh, policy framework. It assumes that monetary policy only inflect, affects inflation, uh, can only affect inflation in the long run. It can't really affect real output or GDP or growth in the long run. All that settles down at its equilibrium level. And there's an implicit assumption also in these models that asset markets will also settle down at equilibrium levels of growth consistent with economic growth. Right? There's, no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no way of... There's no clear way 
of using inflation targeting, in other words, to target uh, asset prices. So one suggestion that's been around in the literature for a while and has come to the fore again in the policy debate is whether we should evolve that um, framework of inflation targeting into something called leaning into the wind. And by that, that's the jargon for saying, should we use uh, interest rates to target asset prices as well as uh, consumer goods prices or goods and services prices? Um, and, that, you know, so the idea would be, I guess, if you think that the asset, your asset markets are rising too fast, prices are rising too fast, there's a bubble there, you would raise interest rates. And that prima facie is, is, is a very attractive idea, but the more I think about it, the, more I'm sort of, the less I'm convinced that it would be satisfactory for a number of reasons. First of all, most asset markets are now part of a, of a global market. If you think about stock markets in particular, um, stock markets in particular tend to move in tandem, at least amongst, uh, amongst developed countries and amongst uh, emerging market economies. So you know, trying to raise, say, UK interest rates in order to choke off an asset market bubble in the, in the UK stock market is likely to be ineffective unless it's coordinated internationally. Um, and while, you know, I am, I'm not totally pessimistic about the outlook for international policy coordination, it's, it's, it, it's a game that's played and it's, it's something that... Um, is not, is not clear to me we're going to get in the immediate future, at least not you know, in a formal level. Second point is, is the interest rate the appropriate instrument for pricking asset market bubbles? How much would you have had to raise interest rates in order to reduce, diminish, prick the, uh, the housing market bubble in the UK or the US in the last 10 years? I would have thought it would have had to have gone up 3-4%, right? Quite large moves in interest rates before they would have any bite at all. And that's, of course, going to have an effect on you know, price inflation. It may dramatically deflate the economy, reduce uh, GDP growth, uh, increase uh, unemployment. There's also, um, there's always difficulty also in, in just getting an agreement on whether we have a, an asset price bubble. You know, the, before this very audience, we've had uh, members of the Monetary Policy Committee within the last few years saying they didn't believe there was an asset market bubble, or at least they weren't convinced there was one, right? So it's, not, it's, it's very difficult um, to place in a policy framework uh, uh, a phenomenon, an asset market bubble, that is difficult to define and difficult to agree on. And really what we have here, moreover, in the in sort of general sense, is what in the old days when I was first learning economics, we called a target instruments problem, which is basically about solving sets of simultaneous equations. You've got to have... If you want to solve a set of simultaneous equations, you have to have at least the same number of equations as you have unknowns, right? And the target instruments problem says if you have a set of instruments you want to solve, you better have the, the same number of targets. Otherwise, you have to trade them off. So we can trade off asset market bubbles against higher, uh, lower sorry, higher unemployment and lower GDP growth, but ideally we'd rather have an, another instrument that we can aim at the asset market. And I'm going to suggest a way we might do that in a moment. Second question, was financial regulation to blame? What, what kind of image do you have when you think of a financial regulator? What do you think a financial regulator looks like? Here's my image. <laughs> <laughs> financial regulation was partly to blame because something that I'm going to refer to as Homer's principle. Now, one of my favourite episodes of The Simpsons is where... Homer discovers he has a long-lost cousin. And unlike Homer, this long-lost cousin is actually successful, and he owns the last... Um, I can see some nodding, you remember the episode. He owns the last um, private uh, car company, auto company in Detroit. Okay, this is pre-crunch, but you get the idea. And filled with family love, uh, the cousin hires Homer as his chief design executive. You know where this is going, right? Uh, and says to Homer, well, you're an average American guy. You can design for me the average American car, you know, to sell. So, so obviously, hires Homer. Homer de designs a dreadful car. Uh, the guy goes bankrupt and fulfills his destiny as a loser, as a member of the Simpson family. But the important point is this. So the, Homer's first idea is this. He says, yeah, I've got a great idea. I've got a great idea for my first design. You, you, remember, you know when you go in the parking lot and you're looking for your car? And you realize that's your car because it's one with the aerial, with the yellow bubble on the end. Everybody should have one. What's, what, why, why is that funny? Because you realize 
that what's good for an individual is not good for a system or may not be good for the system as a whole, right? Now, this idea, in fact, unfortunately, I, I, I like to call it Homer's principle. It's also called the fallacy of composition, or it used to be when I was studying A-level economics over 30 years ago. So what the fallacy, composition, fallacy of composition says is exactly that. What's good for an individual may not be good for a system. And this fallacy actually runs through various aspects of the, um, of, the, of, 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 the, of, the, of the financial crash, the financial bubble. And when Andrew talks later, I think you'll see elements of the fallacy of composition appearing in his talk also. One example, for example, you know when people talk about Goldman Sachs said, oh, there was a 40 standard deviation event. It should only happen once every trillion years or something like this, right? Why did they do that? They ignored the fallacy of composition. Say if I wanted to... Uh, so if I wanted to work out how long it took me to get out of the door in case there's a fire in here, right? I reckon I could bound up there in about three seconds. And if I was, if I was um, pretty sophisticated, I could do it many times and record how many times, you know, the distribution. And then I'd know roughly the distribution of how long it would take me to get out of there when there's a fire. How long will it take me if there's a real fire right now? Longer than three seconds, right? It's going to take me at least three minutes to get out. That would be, a, in my original distribution, a 40 standard deviation event. Once you take into account the systemic consequences, uh, it doesn't become unreasonable. Okay, so where am I going this, that, after that slight digression? Microprudential regulation. So financial regulation is primarily microprudential. It's based on microeconomics. And we all know the true, uh, the true economics is macroeconomics. What is, microeconom why, what is microprudential regulation? It says... Look at the, at the level of a single individual firm, what you need to do to make sure they're behaving prudently. And one thing you do, you make sure they don't lend too much, right? You make sure they've got enough capital, so if enough of their loans go bad, they can cover the, can cover the loans, okay? So there's something called a capital adequacy ratio, uh, the CAR, uh, in, in, in regulation, which says that uh, as it, for a certain amount of loan, you have to have a certain amount of capital. Okay? And the problem with that is that when the capital base expands in value, you can actually lend more. When the capital base uh, shrinks, you have to lend less, which sounds, which sounds good at the micro level. What happens when it happens at the, to everyone at the same time? In a boom, the value... You're kidding. In a boom, the value of assets rises, and so lending rises while the, uh, the capital adequacy ratio is maintained. So that rising liquidity actually fuels the boom and may generate asset price inflation uh, an asset market bubble. So that further inflates the asset base and lending rises again. You get this sort of vicious cycle, right? Conversely, in a recession, what happens is the value of assets fall, uh, the, the capital base of the firm falls, and they have to actually draw in liquidity, right? So it actually exacerbates the recession. So microprudential regulation may exacerbate booms, reinforce recessions, and beget bubbles. <laughs> Macroprudential regulation, however, could be used to supplement, and this is, again, not entirely original. This is around and been around in, in various guises in the, in the policy debate. Macroprudential regulation could be used to su supplement that micro-regulation. And how, one way you could do that is just to make those capital adequacy ratios counter-cyclical. So in a boom, you raise the amount of capital that a, uh, that a, a financial firm is required in order to back its loans, right? So it has to have more capital per unit of lending, which means that it can't just create more and more liquidity in, a, in this cyclical fashion as you go into the up phase of the, of the boom. Similarly, in a recession, the, uh, the financial firm would be required to reduce um, its capital adequacy ratio, or, or would be able to reduce its capital adequacy ratio, so it actually could actually lend uh, more for every unit of capital it holds. So as the, as the capital base shrunk in the, in the, in the recession, liquidity would be eased up. Right? And, you know, in the words, uh, when, you have, um, when you have a crisis, in the words of the great George Bush, unless money is eased up, this sucker could go down. <laughs> so, what suggestion I would like to make is for unification of monetary policy and financial regulation, whereby you continue to use inflation targeting as a nominal anchor. In the US, it'd be very hard to have official inflation targeting because you'd have to go to Congress and, and change the law, but all the Fed would have to do is just publish long-term or medium-term inflation forecasts that were at 2%. That would mean, basically, they had a, they had a, that, that was their de facto uh, inflation target. You use macroprudential financial regulation of that kind to act as an automatic asset market stabilizer while using inflation targeting 
to act as a, a stabiliser in goods markets, and that would then solve your, your target instruments problem. So how long do I have, Mark? A uh, couple of minutes. Okay. Let me say a little bit about quantitative easing then. Um, what well, question is, one point about the, the present policy juncture is the um, question of whether we're in a so-called liquidity trap, what Keynes called in Chapter 13 of General Theory, a liquidity trap whereby interest rates have fallen so low they can go no lower, so increasing the money supply doesn't make any difference. And I don't think we are actually in a liquidity trap. What we're actually in is an illiquidity trap because of the gap between, um, or the spread between actual corporate bond yields and the official overnight, in, or sorry, the official uh, government interest rate, the repo rate, right? So if you look here, for example, I've um, plotted what the current, you know, these are spreads at various levels of risk from double A down to triple B minus uh, as they currently stand, sort of spread over safe rate. And the, um, the orange line, it tells you what those spreads were in the 99-2003 period. And the green line tells you what they were during the period of the Great Depression. So what we're seeing is a huge, unprecedented spreads of the safe rate, if you like, government rate, over those, uh, over those corporate bond rates. So one way in which corporate easing, quantitative easing, which basically means, if you like, printing money and buying bonds with it, one way it could be used is to print money and to buy, um, to buy corporate bonds in order to add liquidity to get those, that corporate bond market uh, uh, working again. And you might see, you know, people say, well, isn't that what they do in Zimbabwe, go around printing money? Well, it, Printing money, if the markets are working properly, reducing interest rates is no different from printing money, right? If you read any principles textbook, that's what it says. The problem at the moment is that the kind of, there's a disconnect, it's broken. So we actually have to print the money and go out and spend it. But obviously it has to be done in a, in a, in a prudent fashion that will not generate higher levels or gross levels of inflation later. So I think my chairman probably wants me to move on. So I'm going to probably stop there and um, perhaps the other point, I'm going to make some other points, but I'll make those um, in when, when, I, when I conclude maybe. But what I, what I do want to talk to you about is a couple of something I noticed uh, an article in the FT last week. So tomorrow I'm going to Japan on a the delegation to meet with, with the Japanese authorities on how um, the UK and Japan can cooperate on, uh, on getting out of the crisis, what, what steps should be taken and so on. And I've been sort of, you know, racking my brains. What if, what if the Japanese Prime Minister asked me, what's your outlook for, um, for, for GDP for next year? Which I think is pretty, it's pretty difficult to, to predict because there's so many uncertainties. But I was reading this nice article in the FT last week about um, the Chinese Lunar New Year and traditional greetings. And how they've had to be changed. So one traditional greeting is, may prosperity come rolling to you. And this has had to be banned, evidently, because the Chinese language is evidently you can very, very, you can, it's very easy to say the wrong thing because a lot of phrases sound identical or they may be written differently. And evidently this, this phrase, may prosperity come rolling to you, sounds exactly the same as laid off and discarded. <laughs> well, my personal favourite was um, may you achieve all your desires. Evidently this sounds identical to very large pay cut. <laughs> so I guess when... Uh, when, when the Prime Minister asks, home, asks me, you know, what's your outlook, Professor Taylor, for GDP and their recession and, so the, and their recovery over the next two years, I'll probably answer him in Chinese. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you.